Hi, this is Mark, and uh, this lecture is Introduction to Optical Mineralogy. It's the lecture we would have done on Monday morning on October 20th, uh, but I have to be out of town. So instead, I'm going to record this lecture, and we're just going to see how it works. Um, the reason it's important to get this lecture done on time is that this week's lab uh, is on optical uh, mineralogy and you're going to get started with the optical microscope and in this lecture is some of the theory uh, that you need to get a, a better handle on what you're actually doing with that microscope when you sit down and look at a specimen through it. So today we're going to just go through uh, some background material on the nature of light, um, specifically visible light, uh, but we're going to talk about the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, polarization and how we polarize light in different ways. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how visible light interacts with different media. For the optical mineralogy, we're going to be talking specifically about uh, visible light interacting with minerals. And the way we observe the effect uh, is using the polarizing light microscope. So we'll talk a little bit about that microscope and, and how it works. Um, the, the concept of the refractive index is really, really crucial in terms of understanding optical mineralogy. So we're going to spend most of this lecture on refractive index um, and how we uh, measure it, which is using the Becky line test method. And then we're going to finish up with a little bit of discussion on anisotropic versus isotropic minerals and how those different minerals appear uh, in the polarizing light microscope. Uh, and on the right, you're just seeing uh, a, a thin section of a rock that has that pseudo-hexagonal crystal in the center. Um, and this is under uh, uh, cross polars. Um, so the, the light is, is polarized, passing through uh, the <clears throat> this uh, thin section. And you can see this beautiful uh, interference colors that um, occur. Um, that's the the interaction of that polarized light with the, with the crystals in this rock specimen. So what is optical mineralogy? It's the study of minerals and rocks by observing and measuring their optical properties. Why do we want to do this? Well, there's three main reasons. One, we can uh, quite easily identify different minerals um, in a rock sample, so identification. We can also look at how chemical or physical changes uh, occur in, uh, in minerals. So um, effectively, we can look at individual crystals in a rock specimen and we can um, oftentimes say something useful about how the chemistry of that crystal um, changes, uh, for example, in proximity to the surface versus the center of a crystal. We can also look at spatial relationships between different minerals, and this is because we're actually looking at rocks. We're looking at minerals uh, in situ or in place. Okay, so they're um, as when they formed, they um, were locked into some specific location in that rock. When we look at them in thin section using the light microscope um, to, for example, to identify the types of minerals there, we actually can see the relationship of them to their neighbors. Okay, this is different from other techniques where we would grind up a rock sample um, in terms to, uh, like, for example, for x-ray diffraction, we oftentimes grind up the samples and then um, get uh, information about the identities of the different minerals present. So we lose the spatial relationships. Optical mineralogy is done using the plane polarizing light microscope, or PLM, and um, a, a PLM is shown in this image here. It's very similar to the type you're going to use down in lab, and we just got a brand new set of these for the department, so um, they're really excellent um, microscopes for teaching and, and even for doing actual research. So um, it looks like a standard light microscope, which you can't see in the body of that um, is, is that it actually has the capability to polarize the light uh, at different points um, between the, the light source, which is down in the very base of the microscope, um, um, between that point and where it actually, uh, uh, you, you look into it at the oculars at the top. There are two uh, polarizing um, uh, crystals in it. There are also some other components that are, are useful for doing uh, optical mineralogy. So we'll learn all of those parts. Um, what's key, though, is that the, 
the light, um, the visible light coming out of the, the light bulb that's in the bottom has to be transmitted through the sample to your eye. We're not looking at samples under uh, reflection geometry. We're looking at light that actually transmits through the rocks and minerals. So that means the minerals have to be put in a, uh, prepared in a specific way. And, and when we prepare them um, for use in the light microscope, they're called thin sections. Okay, and so the, the way we do that is we have a sample we obtain from some location that we're interested in. Okay, we're going to take that rock and we're going to cut it into smaller pieces, and we do that using a special saw that has a, a diamond blade on it. So this, this saw you can see is written on the side. It says brick saw. You can actually cut bricks and tiles with it. You can cut rocks. And the reason you can cut um, things that are hard like that is because the, the blade itself has... Uh, is made of steel, but it, embedded in that steel are small industrial grade diamonds. That's these little greenish colored crystals are actually diamonds. So they're industrial grade. Uh, they're not useful for jewelry, but um, they're very useful for, for making saw blades that are hard enough um, to cut things like rock or ceramic. Okay, so we cut them into the rock up into smaller pieces using a diamond saw. Uh, and eventually we get little chunks that we're interested in. These are centimeters in dimensions, and we glue uh, our little pieces um, known, uh, onto a glass slide, and this is known as a billet. Okay, so there's epoxy now that's fixed this rock specimen to a glass slide. That gets mounted onto polishing um, devices. These are sophisticated ones where you can polish um, a lot of samples very quickly, um, uh, and what you're trying to do is grind, the vast majority of that material gets ground away, and so you get just a very thin specimen that's left behind, uh, and it would look something like that, where um, you can see the, the slide is intact and stuck to the top of it is uh, um, the rock specimen, and what's left behind after all of that cutting and polishing is only about 30 microns in thickness. And if, if those are non-opaque minerals, meaning light can pass through them and they're that thin, then we will be able to transmit light and look at them with the light microscope. Okay, so again, that sample is going to sit right on this stage under those two little clips there. Light is going to come out of the base, pass through, go up through all these different optical features, and then come out at your uh, eye. When we have a, a sample in thin section prepared like I just showed you, we can look at it um, uh, under two types of light. One is plain polarized light. Okay, we're going to talk about what polarized uh, means in a second. But for now, just look at the image and, and what you can see is there are obvious features. There, there are differences um, in the sizes of the minerals that are present. Some, like in this part of the matrix here, seem very small. And randomly oriented. There are then much larger crystals where you can start to make out um, uh, different shapes, squares, and maybe some hexagonal-like features like down here. Uh, but all you really see are, are contrast differences, um, light and dark lines and different shades of gray. So that's under plain polarized light. If we change the conditions of the microscope so that the light is now under what's called cross polars. So there's two polarizing filters in. We'll talk again. We'll talk about that in a second. The the exact same specimen looks very different. All of a sudden, it's it's filled up with with different colors. Okay, and and those colors are different for different minerals. Okay, some are uh, very bright. Obviously, any of these. Crystals are, have very bright colors associated with them. Some are very dark. There's a little hexagonal shaped black crystal there. Um, that under cross polars is very dark. In other cases, if you look down at the bottom here, there's a, a hexagonal shaped crystal that has both a greenish half and then a black colored half. Okay, so there's an obvious uh, line that runs down the two, and so there's something different about one side of that crystal versus the other. And what you notice is if you go back to your plain polarized light and look at that same crystal, that feature is not apparent. So the, the, the difference between plain polarized light and cross polarized light is that there are different features that we can observe. So minerals look different under plain polarized versus cross polarized light. When they're under cross polars, they all, 
Minerals also, certain minerals also look very different when you rotate the sample. So in this video, you're seeing a dunite, which is around 95% olivine, and you see that the bright colors of those crystals fade in color and even go black at certain points as that crystal is rotated under cross-polarized light. In this example, you're looking at muscovite and biotite grains, and initially it was under plain polarized, now cross-polarized light. Again, you see the interference colors change. You see it go from black to colorful to black again. And what you notice in that video maybe is that the, the angle of those crystals going black um, colored to black again is, uh, um, is, is about 90 degrees. So there's information that we can get from uh, those kinds of features uh, under cross-polarized light. So the big thing about using the opti optical uh, microscope is that we can identify different types of minerals based on their optical properties. So in this case, you're looking at a peridotite xenolith, and on the left, under plain polarized light, again, it's mostly featureless, right? There, you see that there's this sort of brownish colored crystal up here looks different from these very whitish colored crystals down here. Under cross polarized light on the right, um, that same brownish colored crystal has now gone to completely black, um, whereas these other crystals now have these bright colors associated with them. And so in the end, what we get out of this is, um, for example, in this case, there's orthopyroxene down here on the left, has that bluish color under cross polars. The clinopyroxenes have this bright orange color, and then the spinels are these dark black colors. And we're going to come back to that at the very end. So why learn optical methods? Well, beyond... Um, mineralogy. Actually, there's a lot of other industries that use optical methods. Um, uh, the FBI and different uh, law enforcement agencies use them, uh, the optical microscope, widely in forensic studies. Um, materials scientists use it uh, for many of the same reasons that mineralogists do um, in terms of understanding the identity of different structures and materials. Um, manufacturing and food industries both use optical methods. A big one is uh, in, in medical technology and especially in pharmaceuticals. Optical methods are used widely in, in pharmaceuticals and understanding the purity of, uh, of crystals um, that are made with different therapeutic agents. Um, and then, of course, in environmental science, um, optical methods are used uh, uh, in terms of understanding mineralogy, of different soils and sediments and so forth, and that goes for resources and mining, engineering, and, and these kinds of things as well. So if you learn optical methods now, you might find that um, uh, different types of jobs, uh, uh, these methods can really come in very useful. So what we're going to talk around, about from here on is the interaction of light and matter. Okay, we're going to focus eventually on just visible light. We'll think more broadly initially. Um, matter, ultimately we're going to want to focus on minerals, but it's useful to think about how light interacts with oils uh, or liquids um, and even glasses, um, just for some of the examples we'll give. But, but we're going to eventually come back to light interacting with minerals. So we need to remember um, some aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's just refresh our memories with that. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum spans all the way from radio waves, which have very long wavelengths, okay, so that's over here on the left, all the way to gamma waves, uh, gamma rays on the right, which have very short wavelengths. Okay, so wavelength is shown with this squiggly line. It's getting shorter and shorter and shorter as you move from left to right, okay, and if you want to think about it in terms of meters, radio waves are, are on the order of meters in terms of their wavelengths. Um, whereas uh, gamma rays are, are on the order of angstroms or less in terms of their wavelengths. Um, and visible light then falls uh, somewhere in the middle. Visible light spans um, a spectrum from 350 nanometers to about 750 nanometers. Now, in terms of understanding the relationship between energy and wavelength, we use Planck's relation for the energy of a photon. Energy big E here, uh, is equal to 
Planck's constant h times the speed of light, which is the small c, divided by the wavelength, which is abbreviated lambda. Okay, so what you see from this relationship is that as energy increases, these things are constant, h and c, wavelength has to decrease then, and vice versa. If energy decreases, wavelength increases. So if we come back to this um, electromagnetic spectrum and we look at the, compare uh, radio waves versus, uh, say, uh, gamma rays, um, and I've added now the energy of one photon in electron volts is on the bottom here. So radio waves then have uh, very low energy, so long wavelength, low energy. The energy of one photon is very small, around 10 to the minus 8 electron volts. Um, for gamma rays, very short wavelength, very high energy, the energy is, is much, much larger, 10 to the 7th electron volts per photon. Okay, so just keep that uh, relationship in mind. Now, uh, light waves have a both a particle nature and a wave nature, but for the purposes of the discussion here, we're just going to think about the, the wave nature of light. Okay, and so what we need to remember, there are two types of waves, transverse and longitudinal. Okay, and so um, transverse waves in the illustration on the top, you can make a transverse wave with a string or a piece of rope tied to the wall. If you fix that rope to the wall and then with your hand hold the other end and very rapidly move it up and down, you're going to make a transverse wave. What happens with that wave, if we just thought about a particle sitting on one part of that rope, how that particle would move in a transverse wave is just up and down. So there's no uh, horizontal or lateral component to the movement of that particle on that wave, it's just up and down. Longitudinal waves are different then. Okay, so to think of a longitudinal wave, you can imagine a spring or like a slinky attached to a wall. Okay, and if you moved your hand uh, in the lateral direction then, you would get a longitudinal wave. Okay, and if you just thought about, again, a particle sitting on one part of that spring, the direction that particle would move then is going to be in this direction, okay, with no vertical component. Okay. So that's, that's the fundamental difference between transverse and longitudinal waves. If you want to see that in this little video, you can and again, think about how a particle would move on any point of that swing, uh, spring. Okay, transverse, it's up and down. Longitudinal, it's back and forth. Okay. This might be familiar if you've had a course that um, taught seismicity and the difference between S waves and P waves. You're talking about the same thing, transverse versus longitudinal waves. An S wave then um, is a transverse wave. If this is a, a section of the crust, these blocks are all chunks of rock. As an S wave passes through that crust, those chunks of rock are going to go up and down. Okay. Um, a P wave then is the longitudinal wave. The, the direction um, of motion is along the, the direction that the wave is propagating. And so this is the, the, the shaking associated with earthquakes. Oftentimes the most destructive part is the P wave. It's that back and forth motion that knocks down buildings and bridges and so forth. Okay, so the idea is the same. Light is one of these two types of waves. It's a transverse wave, okay? So the, the, the direction, there's a vibration direction that is up and down, perpendicular to the propagation direction, okay? So the three main components of a transverse wave, there's an electric component. This is denoted capital E. It's the blue arrows in this figure. There's a magnetic component, denoted B, the pink arrows in the picture. Notice that the, the electric and the magnetic components are perpendicular to one another. It's a 90 degree angle between the blue and the pink arrows. And then there's the green arrow is showing the direction that this light wave is propagating. Okay. And that direction is perpendicular to both the magnetic and the electric components. So the vibration is perpendicular to the propagation direction of the wave. And remember that the vibration of, light wave, of a light wave has a characteristic frequency and wavelength. And we can go back to that electromagnetic spectrum. And for visible light, 
the wavelength is going to fall between about 350 nanometers and 750 nanometers. And that'll give you, in between, you'll get all the different colors of visible light, depending on the, 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 the wavelength. So most light is unpolarized. Most light that we encounter during the day is unpolarized light from a fluorescent bulb, um, light coming from the sun, light coming from a candle is all unpolarized. What does that mean? Well, it means that the photons that are propagating to your eye, they're all propagating along the same direction, but the vibrations of their electric fields are random. The vibrations of their magnetic fields are also random. We're just going to talk about the electric fields for the purposes of this discussion. So in this image here, you see that there's a, a direction of propagation. This arrow is showing you the direction that this light wave is propagating. All these um, um, yellowish colored um, ellipses are the, the vibration directions that you saw that would have had the arrows in them in that previous slide. And so what this is trying to show you is that the the uh, vibration directions, which are perpendicular to the propagation directions, are completely random. There's no specific direction that they're vibrating. It's completely random. Okay, so that's a non-polarized wave. If we were to take what's called a Polaroid, which is a polarizing film, and put it in front of that non-polarized wave, um, we could polarize it. Okay, and, and what that Polaroid is doing is it has these vertical lines the bluish color are, are opaque regions the whitish color are um, transparent so that the light wave could pass through it okay so that you see that there's an axis to this Polaroid it's vertical so if we put that in front of the wave which you can imagine is of all of those random um, vibrational directions only the vertical ones are actually going to pass through Everything else gets blocked by that Polaroid. So what we get from that is then a polarized wave, where the polarization direction here is vertical, the same as the Polaroid filter. If we were to take a second polarizing film and give it a different orientation, so we could turn it 90 degrees um, with respect to the first Polaroid, what you can imagine then is this polarized wave with a vertical vibration direction is not going to pass. Right. So if we put that second Polaroid in, the, uh, the light does not pass through because it, it doesn't match the polarization direction of the light. Okay, so the light gets completely blocked in that case. Now, we see um, unpolarized light all the time. We also see partially polarized light. And so partially polarized light happens when light scatters off of a surface. And that surface could be the glass of a car, it could be the water, um, the surface of a lake or the ocean. Um, and we often, um, when we see partially polarized light, we think of it as glare. Okay, so in this example here, we're seeing light coming off of the windshield of a car without a polarized lens on the top. So, uh, so the light coming off that car, you can see is there's glare associated with it. There's that whitish color, it's actually, the, the clouds and the sky above are part of the glare. So the light reflecting off of that windshield and, and off of non-metallic surfaces in general is partially polarized. And the direction of that partial polarization is parallel to the surface. So in this case, coming off of that glass, the light is partially polarized in this direction, okay, horizontally. Now, on the bottom then, with a polarized lens on, you see that the, the glare disappears and we can actually see the inside of that car. And that's because the polarizer that was used, in this case, it was we could think of it as just have, putting on a pair of sunglasses, the proper polarization axis, the direction of the polarizing film is vertical in the glasses. So it's vertical, whereas the, the polarization direction of the glare is horizontal. So again, it's gonna block just the glare component, and you can see that effect pretty clearly here. Again, it happens when light bounces off of the surface of a pond or a lake or the ocean. You get that glare, partially polarized light in the horizontal direction. Okay, On the left is unpolarized. You see a lot of the glare. You put a polarizing film on, and the glare, for the most part, gets filtered out. Okay, So what's happening with the actual filters, the polarizers? Well, 
again, if, if you have two polarized, po polarized lenses, these are just popped out of a pair of glasses. Um, if the, if the, the polarization axis in this case is vertical in each one of those, if we rotate them either zero or one of them rotates 180 degrees, we're going to see the image coming through the image of the A because the polarization axis, uh, axes are aligned for those two films. Okay, so if we just looked at a little schematic of that, the polarization axis is vertical, they're aligned. What that gives us though, the light coming through those two filters is polarized and it's, um, it's polarized in a specific direction. So that we would call plain polarized light. So PPL. If we were to turn one of the two filters, either 90 or 270 degrees, then that image is no longer visible. The, uh, the two filters on top of one another becomes opaque or black. Okay, and in schematic, that would look something like this. This is known as crossed polarized light, CPL. Okay. Just because of the, the crossing of the two, polar, uh, the axes of the two polarizing films. Okay, so that's polarization. Now we're going to just think a little bit about how light interacts with different media. And, and what we have to think about is that light is traveling at a velocity, or different velocities. And, and the velocity of light is actually different in vacuum versus a liquid, versus a solid, versus a gas. Okay. The velocity of light changes every time it enters a new medium. And we observe this as a change in the angle of incidence. And, and so a way we've, something we've all observed is when you have a glass like this with a straw in it and you look at it from different angles, that straw has this offset to it. Okay. So that's, the, that's a change in the angle of incidence that we're observing. And it's related to the velocity of light and how it's different in the liquid, the water in this glass, versus the air surrounding the glass, and even the glass itself. So to understand this, we, we need to think about um, the phenomenon known as the refractive index. Okay, and what we'll start with is just the speed of light. And all of you know the speed of light in a vacuum, which we denote as small c in italics, is very close to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay, and nothing travels faster than light in a vacuum. So that's the fastest it can go. We calculate the refractive index, which we denote small n in italics, of a material as the ratio of c, the speed of light, and the speed v in that new material. So it's just a simple relationship, n equals c over v. And for n uh, the refractive index of a vacuum, by definition, it's 1. Okay, We have C as being the speed of light. The speed of light in that vacuum is, again, C. So C divided by C is 1. So that's our reference point. In air, because of the gas molecules in air and the way that the gas molecules interact with light as it travels through air, um, the refractive index is slightly higher, but only a little bit. Okay, 0 0.000277 higher than the speed of light in a vacuum. This is at standard temperature and pressure. So effectively, we think of the refractive index of air as also being 1. Since most of all measurements we take using the optical microscope are going to all be taken in air, not in vacuum. So when we think of other media, including minerals, and these are media that are non-opaque, so light has to be able to pass through them for us to observe this phenomenon, the speed of light is going to slow down. Okay, so remember, vacuum is the fastest. Anything other than vacuum is going to be slower. And different media slow down light to different degrees. So water, for example, has a refractive index of 1.33. The lens in our eyes slows down light a little bit more than water, so its refractive index is 1.39 or so. Silica glass, um, like the glass that's in your car or your house, has a refractive index of about 1.5. Halite, 
or rock salt has an index a little bit higher than that, about 1.52. So remember, all of these numbers are greater than 1 because all of these uh, media slow down light compared to light in either air or in vacuum. Now, it's difficult to actually measure the speed of light directly, but it's easy to measure that change in direction that you saw with the straw in the glass. That, so what we can measure is that change in the incidence angle. And then we can use that to calculate the velocity of light. So uh, this graphic is just to show you an example. And, and let me just explain what, what you're seeing. The yellowish part of it is... Uh, is supposed to represent air, so that would be medium 1. Air has a certain re refractive index, n sub 1, which we know is equal to approximately 1. And then in this graphic, in the blue color, the gray color, is a hypothetical crystal of garnet. So this is our second medium now, is a crystal. That garnet has a specific refractive index, n sub 2. And between the garnet and the air is an interface, and that's the solid line that outlines the crystal. So for reference, I've drawn in this um, vertical line, the dashed line, and that's uh, normal to the interface. Okay, so that dashed line is at 90 degrees to the interface of this crystal. So what we can imagine is a, a, a photon coming in at some angle and and striking the, the interface of the crystal in the air. So here comes a photon with some specific frequency and wavelength, okay, and it's coming in at some specific angle of incidence. And that angle of incidence, we denote uh, theta sub 1. Okay, so you see it's the angle with respect to that normal direction. So that light photon has been uh, traveling through medium 1 with a specific speed that's related to its refractive index. Once that light enters the crystal, two things happen. The light slows down because the refractive index of the garnet is higher. Okay? N sub 2, in this case, is higher than N sub 1. So the refractive index, the high refractive index causes that photon to slow down and change frequency. It also changes direction. Okay? And so you see that there's now an angle, again, between the normal, the dot, dashed line, and this, the direction of propagation. And theta 1 is not equal to theta 2. Right? So the direction changed as that photon entered the crystal. When it exits the crystal again, it goes from this higher refractive index medium to a, back to air, which has a lower refractive index. And the light ray returns to its original direction and its original frequency and wavelength. Okay, so it's going fast until it enters the crystal. It slows down as it passes through the crystal, and then it speeds up again and changes direction as it leaves the crystal. Okay, so this, all these relationships between refractive index and the angle of incidence and then the angle of refraction, which is the theta sub 2, is contained in Snell's law. And so Snell's law says that um, the refractive index of medium 1 times the sine of theta of that incidence angle uh, is going to equal to the um, refractive index of medium 2 times the sine theta of the angle of refraction, which is this theta sub 2. So for um, a case where the refractive index of N1 is less than N2, so that's like what we were talking about. N1 is air, N2 is something, um, uh, a garnet with a refractive index that's higher than air. Light is going to slow down when it enters that material, and it's also going to bend towards the normal when it slows down. If the opposite were true, if it was N1 was greater than N2, light would speed up when it entered the material with the lower N, and it would bend away from the normal when it sped up. Now, a different scenario can happen where you have light coming in along that normal direction. Okay, so the light strikes the crystal and it's normal to the interface. So it's at 90 degrees to the interface. And what happens here? 
light still slows down or, and changes frequency. And so in this case, again, N1 is uh, less than N2. So light is going to slow down. But because it's traveling along that normal direction, there is no change in angle. So light passes straight through the crystal with no change in direction, only a change in velocity. When it exits the crystal on the other side, the velocity returns to what it was in air. Um, and again, there's no change in direction because it's traveling along that normal direction. So if theta 1 is equal to 0, then theta 2 must be equal to 0. It's normal to the interface. Light slows down, but there's no change in direction, and then it speeds up again when it returns back to the original medium that has the lower end. Okay, so let's just look at that from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, here we're, we're looking at refractive index of a crystal, so this could be N sub crystal is equal to N sub oil. Okay, so the blue in this case is just some oil with a refractive index that's exactly the same as the crystal, which is the, the box shown in gray here. And again, that normal, the dashed line, is, is showing you uh, the direction normal to the interface. The white are the, the photons propagating along this direction. They're all parallel to one another, coming from left, going to the right. So in the case that the refractive index of the crystal is exactly the same as the refractive index of the oil, those light rays are going to pass through with absolutely no change in direction. Right? And that makes sense. The, they have the same refractive index. There's going to be uh, no effect on the... Um, the direction or the velocity of the light because the refractive indices are the same. When this happens, if we have a crystal uh, immersed in an oil that's identical in terms of the refractive index, the crystal is actually invisible. We can't see it under the light microscope. But if we put it, that crystal in a situation where, for example, the refractive index of the crystal is less than the refractive index of the oil, there is going to be a change in the velocity and the direction of the light as it passes through the crystal. So the scenario is, is set up differently here where the refractive index, the, the N of the oil is higher than it is for the crystal. So as the light comes from the left of the screen, enters this new medium that is the crystal that has the lower refractive index, it actually speeds up in this case. When it speeds up, it bends towards the normal direction. So you can see that angle right there. The light is bent towards the normal, okay, because it's sped up. As it exits the crystal on the other side, it slows down again because of the higher refractive index of the oil. It again bends, but now in this case, it bends away from the normal. So we can observe that effect. There is another kind of effect you see on the top here, where if, if the angle of incidence on the, of the incident photon on the crystal is very, very small, so here the angle of incidence is very large, here it's very small, um, the uh, light ray can be reflected off the surface. It actually doesn't even enter the crystal. It's called a condition of total external reflection. Okay, so there are different things can happen at the crystal edges. Um, and what, what's important about this is that both the reflected and the refracted light is what allows us to see the edges of the grain under the, the light microscope. Now, in real crystals, the shapes are usually quite irregular. Um, and so it complicates things a bit. Irregular particles have many interfaces at different angles. So all of these photons coming in from the left are, are interacting with this crystal and the normal direction for each little piece of interface here are all different. So what you can imagine then is that light is, is being refracted off in many different directions simultaneously. So each of the rays um, will bend toward the normal at a different interface if we have this condition where the refractive index of the crystal is uh, less than the refractive index of the oil. Now. In the plane polarizing microscope, we can make um, a number of standard observations, and we'll, we'll just cover those in a second. But the one we're talking about here is known as relief, which is um, the degree to which mineral grains stand out from the mounting medium. So in these images here, it's obvious what the crystals are in each one of these three images. What you can see is the oil that they're immersed in. 
Okay, so they're immersed in a mounting medium. That's, again, these oils that have a different but known refractive index. Okay, so if the difference between the refractive index of the oil and the crystal is quite large, the relief will be high. The crystals will really stand out because of those, those effects of the refracted and the reflected light off of the mineral grains and the difference between the refractive indices of the two media. If, you, if the difference between refractive index uh, between the refractive index of the oil and the crystal decreases, then the, the relief goes to moderate. If it decreases further, again, the refractive indices are getting closer to one another, the relief goes to low, and eventually if the refractive indices are, are equal, then there is no um, discernible features associated with the crystal. Effectively, the crystals are invisible if the refractive index of the oil and the crystals are the same. So that's relief. Now, again, we're going to make these kinds of observations using a plain polarizing light microscope. And, and if you were to cut open this microscope and look at the individual parts, you, you can see how we start to, to manipulate the microscope so that we can make these observations of, of changing polarization um, uh, and, and so forth. So the, the components are quite simple. We have a lamp at the bottom. The lamp shines off a, a mirror and passes through a polarizer. And in this case, it's not a film. It's actually a crystal that is uh, installed in these, a very high-quality crystal that um, produces light um, that has a particular uh, polarization direction. Okay, so that's what these arrows are, are showing you here. The light then passes through a condenser, okay, which, which passes it through a smaller area that um, is uh, uh, where our... Um, our sample will sit on the specimen stage. Um, we can then change the properties of the light using a, the, an objective. Um, we can magnify it. You can see these guys here are different magnifiers. Um, there are things like compensators that, that are also used. Um, uh, analyzer is another crystal that, that, again, can polarize the light. But in this case, you see the direction is perpendicular to the first polarizer. Um, and then the light eventually comes out through the eyepiece or the ocular, and there's some other sort of accessories that we can put in, uh, one being a Bertrand lens. There's also a, uh, um, yeah, so there's other, other things we can do with these microscopes, but these are the basic parts. Now, we use those microscopes um, to determine refractive index, and the method, um, this Becky line test method, again, involves having crystals that have an unknown refractive index and putting them in oils that have different known refractive indices. Okay, so in the case shown here, um, we have an orthoclase crystal that's been immersed in an oil with a refractive index of about 1.54. So when we put this in the microscope, um, we can see under plain polarized light that there is a whitish band that is formed at the boundary between the crystal and that immersing, uh, that immers uh, the oil that we've immersed it in. Okay. So there are two conditions we can imagine then when we can see the crystal. And this is when, again, the refractive indices are not equal. In one case, we can have um, a refractive index of the oil that is less than the mineral. We don't know that, we just have to try different ones. And if we see this effect, we'll know we're, we're in a position where the refractive index of the oil is less than the mineral. If that's the case, the mineral acts as a converging lens. And so um, the, the, the difference in the velocity of light passing through the edges of the mineral and whether it bends towards or away the normal direction will cause the mineral to act either as a converging lens or a diverging lens. So when the um, mineral has the higher refractive index, it acts as a converging lens, and it concentrates the light above the mineral grain. So the whitish lines you see here move above the mineral grain. Those are the Becky lines. If the opposite case happens where the, the mineral has the lower refractive index, the mineral acts as a diverging lens. So the light rays bend away from the mineral, so that whitish kind of halo or line moves away from the interior of the crystal out to the grain boundaries. So let's um, just go through an example of the Becky line test method. 
So here, uh, just schematically, light is coming, um, polarized light is coming from the bottom of the image traveling towards the top. In the case on the left, the refractive index of the oil is greater than the refractive index of the mineral. So that means that um, the, the light will travel faster in the mineral relative to the oil. Okay, so the light comes through, um, the oil enters the crystal, speeds up. Okay, so when it speeds up, it's going to, um, the light is going to bend away from the normal. Okay, so that means it's going to create this diverging effect okay, on both sides of the grain, on all sides of the grain, really. In the example on the right, the um, opposite is the case. You have the refractive index of the mineral being greater than the refractive index of the oil, so the mineral actually slows down light more than the oil. When that, uh, when that happens, you have uh, the mineral acting like a converging lens, so it brings the light towards the center of the crystal as it goes above it. Okay, if you want to just look at the geometry, this goes back to Snell's law here, the angle of incidence versus the angle of refraction. Um, and, and this is now on a gray line as your normal direction to that interface, which is the heavy black line. You have two different refractive indices, N1 and N2. If N1 is greater than N2, um, as, as that light enters the crystal, it's going to bend away from the normal. So this is going to be giving you that diverging effect. If the opposite is true, where um, uh, the higher refractive index is the mineral, the light is going to bend towards the normal and it's going to have a converging effect on the light. So um, the way we observe this in the microscope is we have our minerals um, in different oils, okay? one be having a higher refractive index, one having a lower refractive index. And then what we can do with the microscope is actually change the location of the focal plane. So that's this uh, horizontal dot dashed line. Okay, if the focal plane is directly on the center of the mineral, it's going to appear in focus. If we move the focal plane up, you can see that what we're going to see is where that light is intersecting that focal plane is moving out. In the case of the refractive index of the oil being greater than the mineral, it's moving, the intersection point is moving in. In the case of the, the refractive index of the mineral being greater than the oil, and the further we move that focal plane, the more pronounced that effect is going to become. So when we actually look at that same thing with actual crystals shown here, here we're focused exactly on the mineral grain itself. It's, it's sharply in focus. Um, we don't really see the Becky line. Um, when we move the focal plane up, in the case on the left, where the mineral is acting as a diverging lens, you see this whitish halo moving out to the grain boundary. In the example on the right, where the opposite is true, the whitish line is moving in towards the center of the crystal. And the more we uh, defocus from the grain, the more pronounced that becomes. Okay, so in, in doing that, we can actually, again, the mineral is the unknown here. All we've done is changed the refractive index of the surrounding medium, which is this oil. Okay, so we go high and low, and we figure out where our crystal falls relative to that. So, um, so again, the plane polarizing microscope allows us to make some standard ob observations, relief being one of them. We've already talked about this. It's all related to, a, to the last uh, bunch of slides. There are other things we can observe, certainly cleavage planes. And if you go back to some of those earlier slides that I showed, you can see um, the sort of fracturing of those minerals, and there are cleavage planes in there, and we can actually measure the angle. Uh, for example, in pyroxenes, we know that um, the, the relation of the cleavage planes is around 90 degrees or so, and we can measure that, and that will help us feed into our mineral identification. Similarly, in the case of amphibole, we know that, that the cleavage planes are at a much different angles, um, so it, would it be, allow us to distinguish um, two related minerals. Color, we can also use color. Um, incident light coming out of that microscope is white light. It has all wavelengths, uh, the visible spectrum. Okay. The crystal can act effectively like a filter by absorbing certain wavelengths of light. In the case of this red 
crystal, the only light that we're perceiving is red because that's all that's been transmitted. Everything else in that spectrum has been absorbed. So we can use color as one of the standard observations. Related to that, we can also observe an effect um, where some minerals, um, minerals that have more than one refractive, refractive index, so basically depending on which way you're looking through the crystal, the refractive index can be different. Um, we see this effect known as pleochroism, where the color actually changes as you look at different angles. And this happens, as you can see in these images, just in the case of visible light of this crystal sitting out in the sun. So the last part, uh, isotropic versus anisotropic minerals. Um, so this is how the structure, the actual underlying atomic structure of minerals, uh, relates to their optical properties. So in the case of isotropic minerals, light rays travel the same speed through the crystal regardless of the vibration direction. doesn't matter which way direction light entered the crystal, it's always going to travel the same speed. Okay. All cubic minerals are isotropic, but there are only a few common ones that we see over and over again in rock specimens. So these, just for example, are the spinels or garnets, um, are both examples of cubic minerals um, that are isotropic. In that example I showed earlier where we had um, this pritotite that has uh, spinel in it, so you can see this SP is labeled spinel up here. When we go under um, plain polarized light, it has that sort of brownish color. We go to cross polarized light now, um, that those minerals go completely black. Okay, it doesn't matter which way we rotate this stage, at any angle that spinel is gonna remain black and that's because, um, um, because it is isotropic. Now there's another uh, phenomenon we haven't really talked about, we're gonna to get to that soon, but just for now remember that if that mineral is black, it is considered extinct. If that mineral is brightly colored or white, um, it's considered not extinct. So anisotropic minerals then are different in that light travels with different speeds for different directions of travel. And these directions are corresponding with different crystallographic directions. Okay. Minerals also exhibit a phenomenon or an effect known as double refraction. So anisotropic minerals are all non-cubic minerals then. Okay, so this includes hexagonal, tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, and triclinic are all anisotropic. And what you can imagine then is most minerals you're gonna look at under the polarizing light microscope are going to be anisotropic. They're gonna exhibit this effect known as double refraction. They're also gonna exhibit these interference colors, those bright colors that you've seen uh, under cross polars in the last few slides. And one interesting aspect that we're gonna talk about more is that anisotropic minerals actually themselves polarize light. So they act as a polarizer um, when when non-polarized light passes through them, it comes out polarized. And so a common example um, that we'll discuss further is calcite. On the right is a calcite single crystal. Light coming through that crystal after bouncing off of this page with the text on it, um, you see is now there's a double image there. That's this effect known as double refraction. Okay, that, what that calcite crystal is actually doing is splitting light so it's splitting a single photon into two photons. It's giving you that double image. It's actually also polarized. We'll talk about that further. Um, and so that's the lecture for today. Um, um, please uh, listen to it, hopefully before lab. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday, if not um, early next week. Thanks.